The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 136206689589, AFSL 5037411, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome listeners, as we embark on an exhilarating journey into the world of impact investing. I'm your host, Karen McLeod, and I'm thrilled to guide you through this four-part series where we'll explore the dynamic landscape of finance with a conscience. It's more than just numbers on a spreadsheet. It's about driving change and shaping a future where prosperity knows no bounds. So join me on this exhilarating journey as we explore how finance meets purpose. Investing used to be just about making a meaningful return on your investment. But what if your investment could not only deliver a return on your investment, but also do more good, both environmentally and socially, for the world we all live in? The opportunities now to own quality businesses that have the potential to create a positive impact on society and the planet are broader than they have ever been. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. By understanding clients' needs and delivering timely, actionable insights and solutions, we can help them navigate change and achieve better outcomes. Welcome to episode three of our podcast series on impact investing. I'm Karen McLeod, and today we're joined by James Baird, a seasoned advisor from Just Invest in WA, who's going to provide some insights into how he integrates impact investing into an investment philosophy and the underlying processes involved in his work. So, James, welcome. Thanks, Karen. Good to be here. Um, James, I wanted to find out from you, the listeners might know that impact investing isn't about financial return solely. It's about investing their, um, aligning their clients' investments with their personal values and obviously affecting positive change in the world. Can you share some insights on how you integrate your um, impact investing into your practice, like how you select an investment strategies that resonate with your clients? Yeah. So obviously, when we've been through the fact find process with clients, we've done the normal risk profiling um, assessments and had had conversations around um, time frames, you know, the sleep at night test, market volatility, etc. Uh, but also we run through the ethical profiling, uh, which is done through um, a questionnaire, but also some conversations. And we talk about on the ESG front what clients would prefer to screen out, but we also ask what would they like to screen in or support? And then from that, we've got a pretty good idea of the areas that they'd like to invest in and and really the areas where they'd like to see the the, the most positive impact created. Um, and so we link that up to um, our various investment managers and their offerings and um, ultimately we're the conduit of um, matching the two together. So we get a very good understanding of the fund managers that, that that work in impact investment and whether they're wholesale or retail uh, and um, a, and then match match them both together for long-term investment. That sounds perfect. So, but in the real world, I suppose, could you walk us through maybe the process of, like, can you think of one client where they've come to you with a specific need? It might be um, affordable housing or uh, gender diversity, are there certain topics or certain thematics that they're looking to address within their investments or wanting to make an impact with their investments and how you were able to, I guess, select from the market the most appropriate investment for them and then how you were able to articulate to the client that it did align with their preferences? Yeah. I mean, we deal with um, mum and dad retail investors. We deal with wholesale clients. We deal with organisations as well. Uh, we've had um, organisations in not-for-profit sector. Um, some are more focused on environmental issues because that's the area that they work in. Um, others are, are, are focused on things like um, 
the disadvantaged and affordable housing and, and, and things like that because um, they work more on the social side. So um, it's been interesting to you know match up um, some of those organisations to those um, impact investments. And um, as I say, sometimes in the wholesale environment, you can you can say right, are you prepared to um, invest that money for you know seven to ten years plus? Um, and if so, there's some um, really clear positive impact that you can get by working in these areas. And um, as I say, we've we've done that for organisations both on the environmental side and then on the um, uh, social side as well. For the um, mum and dad investors, uh, similarly, they'll often come in with um, some particular uh, areas that they that they'd like to support more, um, and that's through their personal experience. It might be through their occupation. Um, you know, it, it, it could be um, for a range of reasons, and they'll say, "Right, um, environmentally, I'll I want to support renewables," um, or, or they might say, "Look, I, I want to help the the disadvantaged." And um, it's not to say that if, if you uh, want to help the disadvantaged and and work uh, more on that social side, you're not also going to get some positive impact created on the environmental side through the portfolio. It's not sort of one or the other. Um, but we can certainly tailor uh, preferences um, according to um, the areas that they're probably most interested in. And, of course, the conversations when you come back and review those clients um, might be a bit more focused on, right, you know, you wanted to support um, affordable housing um, or other particular areas, and this is this is how it's going. Hmm. So it sounds like the clients that you are matching – um, or integrating their impact investment preferences into their their overall investment philosophy come from sort of all generations and all walks of life. Um, would you say that that's true, James? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We've got we've got retirees uh, right through to, to to people in their twenties. Yeah, look, I mean, we're, I'm based in WA. We've got people that work for mining companies um, that want to create really good positive impact. And um, and and we've got people that work in a range of um, of whether it's not for profits or or renewables and, and um, in all sorts of different areas. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not um, it's not one particular category of client. Um, it could be high income earners, lower income earners, high asset position, lower. Um, it's a it's a really diverse mix, and um, yeah, it certainly makes the, the work interesting. That's for sure. It does. And I think that's important to highlight for those listening because um, it's important to raise these conversations with your clients because it's hard to make assumptions unless you ask the question. Um, you, yeah, Well, you can't make assumptions, I should, should say, unless you ask them the questions about if they would like to have an impact with their investments. So would you agree that that's the case, James? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I mean, in those initial conversations with clients, you know, some really interesting um, things can come out. I mean, I had I once had a client who said um, my family owned a tobacco um, plantation in South Africa, and um, you know my dad never smoked, but my mum did. Um, she passed away, and uh, you know I would never invest in a tobacco company. You know, there's just uh, stories like that that, um, that that every client's got. Um, they've just got to be asked the question, mm. and um, and it's just I guess they're just reiterating. Um, the conversation isn't about my ethics or or our company's ethics. It's about the client and um and you know what's their ethical views, you know what's their moral compass uh, look like, and, and and what are the key areas that they'd like to um, avoid and support. That's true, and also letting them know perhaps education is part of your role as well, educating them that that impact investing can have a place in their overall investment strategy. Um, because it's perhaps not very well understood and being able to show them that you're able to select different strategies that align with their preferences is quite probably quite a powerful thing to deliver as their advisor. That's right. And I, I don't think, I think it's maybe a bit of a misconception that that someone could, could walk in as a prospective client, as a prospective investor and say, oh, I'm prepared to forego some return um, in order to create impact. Um I don't think I've really, you know, had that that specific conversation with people. Um, it's more about um, let's invest uh, in in the usual way, 
with the usual risk profiling and and according to um, strict asset class guidelines. Um, but uh, let, let's also try and get some positive impact here and, and, and let's do what we can to, to make the world a better place. And let's measure those returns according to benchmarks. And um, if, if they're above benchmark, then great. Um, if they're below benchmark, then let's try and understand um, why and if we're comfortable with that. So it doesn't have to be a separate conversation about, you know, you're going to get a lower return here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more an integrated conversation about let's get you um, the the, the um, appropriate returns for your risk profile, um, but let's also create some really good positive impact along the way. Um, because if you're not doing that, then where, where does the line get drawn between a charitable and a philanthropic you know, uh, donation type thing versus an investment. So uh, we sort of make it clear where we are on the investment side of the equation. I think that's great to highlight that you play that education role to clients and also connecting the investments. But is there another role that you also play, James, is that, you know, clients might be concerned about greenwashing. And so your job is also to really ensure that the investments you're recommending generally align with their values and generally do have positive impact. So how do you mitigate that risk of greenwashing for your clients? Yeah, I think it's safe to say that a lot of people that come to us or come to any advisor would have already done some research online and probably um, can understand that there's some managers doing impact investment out there, but they're just not sure. They're just not sure um, is this one, you know, greenwashing, uh, or are they true to label? Um, what are the different nuances between the different managers out there? And so that's that's a sort of information that they're they're seeking from us. And um, for us, it's just a matter of getting to know the various managers out there, um, getting to know the ones that are doing greenwashing, whether it's inadvertent or not. We've just got to you know have have a pretty good understanding of that. And um, and not only get to know what's currently in a fund manager's portfolio investment wise, but get a feel for that fund manager's you know philosophy and culture because we've got a we've got to forecast what sort of investments that fund manager is likely to put in in the future, um, mm-hmm. so so we don't get egg on our face at a later date. When um, we see a, um, a holding in there that surprises both us and the investor, and th- that can happen um, from time to time, um, the way that we, uh, I guess, mitigate that risk is to have ongoing conversations with with fund managers. And from time to time, there will be an investment that pops up in an impact manager's portfolio, and you you, you might raise the question. You might say, "Look, I just want to get a bit of understanding of, about." You know about why CleanAway is in your portfolio because CleanAway's had some environmental issues recently. Um, you tell us why you've you've seen fit to to add them to to the to the portfolio, uh, and if you've got a good relationship with 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 the manager, you'll be able to have a pretty open conversation about that. And um, more often than not, they can come back and explain that to you and um, um, some pretty detailed reasoning. Um, around why they've included um, that sort of a that sort of a company, you know, for example, yeah, clean away spending um, some serious capital on um, waste to energy projects and et cetera, et cetera, and recycling and so on. Uh, if it, if if the fund manager can't explain well enough, or if if they explain it to you and you just feel like uh, as an advisor or, or or the actual investor would would be uncomfortable about that. Then you know that there's a mismatch and a misalignment, and it might be time to um, exit that manager. So um, you know, no one will 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 um, try and say that it's an absolutely perfect system when you've got a range of fund managers, a range of portfolios. But I think that um, transparency and then the monitoring of the holdings, um, and then and then afterwards, like the, the actual measurement of the of the portfolio impact. I think all of those things. Um, wrap up into um, a, a, a process that can make you pretty comfortable um, that your investors, you know, your clients will be happy um, with with the impact being created. It does sound like 
advisors that are prepared to give advice on impact investing need to be prepared to do thorough research initially and then ongoing due diligence to ensure that they stay ahead of the wave. I suppose, as you say, like if there's anything brewing, they need to make sure that they are connecting regularly with the manager, being aware of the constituents within the portfolio, and then having those conversations, which sometimes might be difficult with the manager about um, certain holdings, but then also articulating that back to the client to give them, would you say, the opportunity to either exit or further engage with the manager. I suppose that's probably the the role that an advisor plays in this space. Would you agree? Yeah, correct. I mean, a, a really simplistic example around that that probably a, a lot of advisors would have would have come across is is Tesla. Mm. Right? So, so Tesla um, for the managers that that we work with in Impact, they really don't don't hold um, a, a stock like that currently. Um, it's not to say that they never will. Um, but they're con- they've had concerns about the governance and the social side um, of the operations. Uh, so, and, and you might have a conversation with a client, and I say, "Look, I'm I'm quite comfortable with Tesla because I feel like environmentally they're doing such good things." Um, whereas another client might say, "You know what? Yeah, I get it. Um, they haven't treated their staff well for various reasons, and um, the governance side is 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 a bit of a roller coaster ride." Um, and so, you know, you, you could you, you can engage with a manager on that, um, but ultimately, um, it can be just a, a difference in viewpoint which governs the the way that you invest for that client. It's great to have that great example. Thanks for that, James. Um, which brings me sort of to my next question: Is given that when you're servicing clients that have got impact investments, how do you how do you review the suitability of the impact investments within their portfolio year on year? Are there examples that you could provide of how you measure the impact the investments are having and how they connect with the client's investment objectives? Um, what do you include in reports, for example? Is there any data that you provide? Um, advisors might be interested to know, like research houses that provide information on this. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, my um, suggestion for any advisors that are interested in this area would be to try and use a really wide range of, of, of resources, and that's um, the various research houses, software tools, and the fund managers' um, impact reports and information. We use uh, software tools by Ethos and um, Sustainable Platform, um, among others, but um those two particular software packages will literally take a dollar value that the client has invested and match it to, um, I guess, real world impacts. Um, you know, waste avoided, cars off the road, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, emissions avoided, and so on. Um, so uh, that that gives the client really a, a snapshot type position of you know compared to the benchmark. This is the this is the real impact that that you have made, and uh, that's that's a I guess a good starting point. Um, that that's pretty broad, you know. And th- those software tools are handy. Some of the fund managers will use we use the same thing. Um, and um, in fact, some of the some of the managers over in the UK have been doing that for at least a decade and 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 measuring their impact in that way. So it sort of keeps their team accountable, and you know delivers something pretty useful to the client. Uh, but as I say, the impact reports that are produced by the fund managers and I, I would say are getting better and better. And I think the the standard uh, has um, got to a point where it's really not just a case of saying, look, these are the companies we've invested in and, and we're doing some great things here. Uh, I, in many cases, they're broken down company by company, what is the justification for um, investing in this company and what are the outcomes that um, uh, you're seeing and that are underway? And also, how have you engaged with that company? Like, What, what, what have you been talking to them about? What, it, what, uh, what would you like to see them um, doing better? So the idea that you, you just, you know, Purchase a, uh, a a holding in the company and and sit on it and um, and then exit at a at a later date 
is not really what an impact manager does. Um, you're, uh, you're really assuming um, that they are doing this, all of this um, behind the scenes work and can um, explain to you uh, what that what that looks like. Um, and, and when I say that, it's not just a case of, yes, we've had various um, company meetings throughout the year. It's ha- have you met with that company, how many times, and what were the measurable outcomes? And I think, um, you know, for, for, for those of us advisors that have been working in eth- ethical investment for over, the, over a couple of decades, I've seen that really change because 10 or 20 years ago, a fund manager probably could get away with it and say, oh, well, Yes, we've engaged with them on this issue. Um, but these days we would say, okay, you engage with them on a particular issue. What was their response? What was the outcome? And if you didn't get a response, what's your next step? Uh, and um, there's, uh, there's a lot of accountability on, on that front. Um, so, yeah, so I, 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 back, to, back to your original question. The, like, when I sit down uh, and, and review with a client, I would normally be doing a PowerPoint presentation and I would um, show them some of those measurements, but also really talk about some of the key case studies and holdings um, within their portfolio because um, there's a lot of information that we give to clients as advisors and it's a lot for people to take in in a, in a one hour or one or two hour um, review session. So uh, I, I always try um, to leave the client with some short and sharp case study examples um, and say, look, did you know um, that you know this bond manager has just purchased a, a, a green bond in the Ivory Coast or whatever it might be, um, that would be of real interest to that client. And look, they, they might then take that away and go and talk to their family or friends about that say look this is this is an area that I that I wanted to be doing some um, investing in and um, it's really happening this is what's going on and you don't get that from an annual statement that they that they receive uh, once a year from the from the super fund or or an investment manager um, it's it's through those conversations where you can really point out those those um, those examples and also I, I guess I would say um, it's great to have impact reports from the fund managers but um, more often than not, our clients won't sit down to read a 60-page um, impact report from one manager and then the next one and the next one. It's just a bit too much to ask. So we can um, summarise that info and pull out the um, really interesting bits for them. So wise, James, definitely, because you've got so much information and great information. It's worthwhile um, spending the time and making sure you've got enough time within your meeting to, to give a few good takeaways. I would agree with that. Um, so when you think about impact investing, not only are they delivering financial returns, they're delivering great stories you can talk to your clients about that meet their personal goals and values, would you also view impact investments as providing diversification, income generation, growth drivers? What else does it or a combination of all of the above. How does impact investing differ from, say, traditional portfolio construction in your portfolios? I think broadly we would see them as generally being in growth areas, um, growth sectors, uh, rather than sectors that are that are shrinking or declining or um, you know effectively being replaced as per as per fossil fuels. Um, it can be a, a, a diversifier in terms of really uncorrelated um, to uh, the rest of the market in some cases, um, and um, and look, I mean, it probably comes out of that income generation category as well. But I would come back to that initial point about really being strict on risk profiling an asset class and building um, it from the um, you know. A very process-driven approach, uh, and and um, not asking your impact portfolio to do anything much different than that than 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 a regular portfolio. Say, so, okay, we've got an impact investment overlay. Um, are we talking growth defensive or a or a split via the alternative side? Um, and uh, and let's let's get that in place and let's measure it according to benchmarks. This comes back to you know not 
asking the client to um, take a take a discounted portfolio return because they're trying to create positive impact. I think James also it might be um, useful to to let uh, listeners know that um, when you're discussing all these things with clients, it can it can be quite a lot for them to take in, can't it? So as you've sort of alluded to earlier, that you might need to to stagger these discussions over over the course of like months or even years because for clients to get their head around this as a concept or a different investment philosophy can be quite um, quite a lot. Um, I heard an interesting idea yesterday that um, could resonate with some advisors because we all keep hearing about sort of the aging population and the intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, and I immediately thought of impact investing because – When we're talking about leaving a legacy, um, often people want to make a difference with their funds. And I and I thought immediately of impact investing because it's a way whether you're thinking about creating a philanthropic foundation or um, making um, a gift to a child or a loved one, they might then wish those funds to go ahead um, into impact investing um, options. So it could be a way for an advisor to get uh, closer to their client, to understand a bit more about their intentions for their estate planning, and also get closer to their children by raising um, these sorts of discussions. What What do you think? Have you got any experience in that? Yeah, I saw some research recently where they were looking at the the high net worth sort of category and, and saying that the the next generation who's inheriting those the, that those large amounts of capital isn't necessarily looking to donate or. Um, you know, f- philanthropic giving so much as um, investing with impact, investing, taking into account um, ESG criteria, and um, you know, making the world a better place um, with those funds. And um, and I think it comes back to like some of our some of our older clients have inherited funds from their parents, and they with the intention of um, supporting education. Of the kids and grandkids, um, and and you know that that's a really common one. So I think if you extrapolate that out, it's um, you know that that those next generations inheriting those funds, um, whether it's for education, helping the disadvantaged, uh, you know the energy crisis, um, you know a range of different positive impacts. It does it does fit really neatly, um, and um, and and we're. We really are having a lot of conversations um, around that. I think, uh, as I say, it, it can be information overload if you try and get, you know, try and spill out too much information to to, to investors at once. And um, and a, a really interesting area is is bonds, you know, impact bonds um, and, and, and green bonds and so on. And you know, really. 90% plus of the general public don't really know how a bond works, a regular bond. And and we're, we're then adding this overlay of, hey, look at this amazing impact that you can get um, for investing in in this bond or, or these types of bonds. Um, and that's another thing for the client to get their head around. So I do, as I say, I come back to really simple um, case studies. And and, um, and and I think for clients, it's number one, it's not just um, companies that you can invest in to create positive impact. It's actually bonds as well. And um, this is how it works. This is what where your capital goes. Um, this is uh, um, the, the type of organization that would issue a bond, maybe the International Finance Corporation or something like that. Um, this particular bond is being invested in by this manager because they're building a hospital in Bangladesh. Um, and it's the, the fund manager's job to ensure that those funds are being used for that purpose um, in a responsible sort of way, so they'll they'll monitor that um, for the life of the project, and then um, and also manage it for risk. You know, is there um, what are the various risks that could impact that bond um, for the life of that term, and then um, uh, at, at the end of the process, then be looking to reinvest that capital um, in the next project. So, uh, as I say, if you if you said to a client. Um, we're investing in XYZ fund that 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 invests in impact bonds. That's um, that's a good start. But if you said, look, you're supporting all of these projects in developing countries and developed countries as well, um, and here's some examples, 
as I say, that's the bit that they really latch onto and say, oh, okay, um, I get it. I'm, I'm supporting those projects. And also, secondly, um, we ran through the returns and I can see that my returns are in line with a benchmark or you know, uh, above or below, but they would know the reasons why. 100%. I think you're right. I think using the stories and normalizing, giving them tangible um <laughs> tangible examples. The one I always use is the Queensland Treasury Corporation green bonds um, have built like the Gold Coast Light Rail and the Sunshine Coast Solar Farms and Brisbane Bikeways because my clients are local to Queensland. So for them, they identify with those projects and they can understand that it's being issued by a government authority, which provides them with um, confidence in the issuer. And so when you start that story, then you can then sort of extrapolate from that, as you've said, by saying, well, this is happening in other jurisdictions in the world where they're also, you know, retrofitting their energy systems or their busways or whatever they're doing. They're raising capital so that they can make their sewage treatment plant more energy efficient. So they're doing this in Sweden or the local council here is doing it in or the French government's issued their largest green bonds so they can transform their economy. So when clients start to understand those stories um, and they're given a choice between providing, I suppose, capital to something that has impact or something that has <laughs> no transparency and they've got no control over where the funds are going, you, you can start to see that it, it's much easier for them to make that decision. Um, and it, as you say, like it will take a while and a few conversations, um, but you can sort of demonstrate in that interchangeability between impact and non-impact to clients when you can show them returns and case studies with impact funds are very, um, very transparent and and providing actually a really positive difference with their money. Yeah. Have you got That's any... Right. Sorry, James, I was just going to say, have you got um, any stories of what clients have said after you've been able to tell them those sort of stories? I mean, sometimes they'll say, keep up the good work. And I, 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 I sort of feel like it's actually the fund manager's good work uh, in, in, in finding those investments for us. Um, but as I say, they, they realise that we're um, uh, you know part of that chain that's that's allowing them to access um, that, that type of investments. Um, and also... Sometimes I'll talk with clients and 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 say, you know, look, we've met with um, half a dozen fund managers and we've really turned away almost all of them in terms of investing in your portfolio. Currently, um, there's one that we're having a closer look at for these reasons, and uh, you know that um, in some ways it's great that we could meet with with with, with a number of managers working in this space because, as I said, decades ago there. There, there wasn't really as much on offer, and now we're being spot for choice a bit more. Um, but it's it's that recognition that uh, whilst there are managers are operating in this space, it might not suit the client for investment reasons, as in we just can't lock up the the, the money in an illiquid way in a wholesale investment for seven to ten years plus, or you know, or it might be the fees, or it might be um, some other part of it, and um, not as I say, inadvertent greenwashing as well from time to time you might actually review a client and say look um we've we've assessed a uh some, some new managers and look we we really don't think that there's that there's any additions to make to your portfolio right now and uh you know that's okay uh, they know that you're just doing that work behind the scenes to assess those managers and um uh you know when the time comes and we can get greater impact in their portfolio then we'll jump at that that opportunity. So I guess I guess that's that's maybe the way we assess some of those managers. Like for like in the impact space, is there another investment that could create more positive impact for your client? Maybe it will get the same returns, but maybe there's more positive impact. And that's a that's a really interesting area. So is a particular manager working in hard to abate areas of emissions? And you know, looking at innovation in those sort of areas, and that could be an example where, um, on the um, energy side, um, that 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 you make a change for a client, or it could be um, to do with affordable housing, disability housing, um, and, and some of those social areas where you're looking, going, hey, we can get more impact by by choosing this investment. So um, yeah, as I say, I find that an interesting area, and um, and as I say. 
even if markets, and I always say this about, about the broader ethical investment space, even if markets are having a tough time, you can still have a great conversation with your client about the positive impact that's been created in the portfolio and not worry about what markets are doing this week. So true, James. It's it's the stories, the positive impact that continues despite what's happening potentially that particular week in markets. And it's also the ability to have ongoing positive and incremental change for the clients and continuous improvement really in the work that you're doing through your obviously your continued due diligence and your ongoing research and your ongoing monitoring of their portfolios and the holdings and looking for alternatives um, to just make sure that they're getting as much impact as possible. And I think with this field, it's certainly going to be quite a dynamic field and certainly keep growing because there's no end of clients that are seeking positive um, financial returns and positive impact. So for those advisors that are considering it, you know, remember to be effective communicators and maintain your transparency with your clients on, on what they're holding so you can truly align their values and objectives with what you're putting in their portfolios. Did you have any closing remarks, James? Yeah, I would just say uh, clients are often um, visual in terms of the information they're taking in. So, I mean, I preferred way to show them some of this information is by PowerPoint, but, um, you know, whether it's PowerPoint or get it up on the screen or whichever way you'd like to do it, uh, show the clients some case studies, some some pictures, um, show them some information from the impact report, because as I say, they're not going to read a 60-page report. They just don't have the time. Um, so just pick out some key information. And every time that you, that you have a chat to them, um, just, just bring up um, some of those points, show them something different, show them the positive impacts they're created. And uh, as I say, it just um, is a great conversation to have with a client. And, um, uh, you know, as I say, they leave the leave your office, um, leave the meeting um, with a pretty positive um, view of the work that's being done behind the scenes. So, um, yeah, I really um, enjoy working in this area and uh, I really encourage um, other advisors to to also do more um, in terms of impact. James, it's been such a pleasure learning from you today. I hope all the advisors listening to this podcast have taken away many gems from your um, expertise. I can't thank you enough for um, your really insightful comments. And thank you also to um, to those that are listening today. If you're interested, there are some other podcasts in this series. So at that point, I will sign off. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for the time.